In this week's video, we'll review the latest charts, data sets, signals, and studies to help us answer the question, have we seen full capitulation and a reversal in stocks? Or is this just the last gas before a scary 2008-like plunge? We've got a lot to cover. We'll be moving quickly. The video is designed so you can use the pause button on your video player. You may remember from last week's video, we covered the 9 and 13 active signals that speak to a higher probability of trend exhaustion and a possible reversal. And to recap from last week, we covered numerous cases that were similar. The 2011 case with an active 913 that was also associated with a noticeable Fed pivot near the low. Similar situation in 2016, a 9 and 13 and a Fed pivot in close proximity. The 2018 case did not have a 9 and 13, but it did feature a Fed pivot a few days after the low. And the 2020 case also had a 913 near the March 23rd low with a massive Fed pivot in the form of unlimited QE. Thus, a week ago, we said we have the 913s, but unlike three of those four cases, we really didn't have anything in hand that approximated a Fed pivot. And you may remember last week we stated that the Fed wasn't the only possible source of a pivot. We could get some type of improvement relative to inflation data. Interest rates could calm down a little bit. We could see some type of positive development out of Russia or Ukraine. Or the economic data could clear some type of hurdle that the market deemed reasonable. If you were watching the markets closely on Friday, May 20th, a week ago, the charts intraday looked absolutely positively terrible. And then the market rallied strongly into the close and basically finished flat for the day. The S&P was up one point approximately. So things weren't looking particularly good as of a close on Friday, May 20th. If we fast forward from Friday, May 20th, to the next trading session, Monday, May 23rd, unbelievably, we get something that approximates a Fed pivot. Rate hike pause in September may make sense, Fed's Bostic says. And then a couple of trading days later on Wednesday when the Fed minutes were released at 2 p.m. Eastern time, headline from Reuters, FOMC minutes gives Fed leeway to ease up on rate hikes. Bloomberg. Fed saw aggressive hikes providing flexibility later this year. And we tweeted this portion of a Bloomberg article on Wednesday from our Twitter feed from the Fed Minutes. Many participants judged that expediting the removal of Fed policy accommodation would leave the committee well positioned later this year to assess the effects of policy firming which you can make an argument leaves the door open to a pause later in the year. So it's probably fair to say now we do have some statements from the Fed that are at least slightly more dovish. And interest rates here, here's the 10-year yield, it's dropped quite a bit in a short period of time. Do we have anything else in hand as of the close on May 27th to tell us to keep an open mind about better than expected outcomes or a bottoming process in conjunction with the 9 and the 13? It's interesting to note, three of the four cases that we covered last week, 2011 had a 913 and a pivot. 2016 had a 913 and a pivot. 2020 had a 913 and a pivot. Fast forward a week, and as of Thursday, we had back-to-back 80% up days, NYSE 80% up days. You can see from Mark's tweet here, here's his Twitter handle. Yesterday's back-to-back 80% -back upside volume is constructive, but more evidence is needed to confirm an important bottom. You can see similar signals didn't necessarily mark the end of a process. So as of Thursday, the data is somewhat saying, keep an open mind about a bottoming process, but probably not too prudent to throw all caution to the wind, given this is 2008 here. Fast forward one day to the end of Friday's session, and we got back to back to back NYSE 80% updates from Walter Deemer. Since October of 2010, this has happened three times, March 24th through the 26th of 2020, February 12th to the 17th, 2016, and October 5th through the 7th, 2011. 
Those are the three cases that we covered a week ago. Those are the three cases with the 913s that we covered that also featured pivots. So if we look at the 2011 case, here's the low, here's the 913, and here's the back to back to back 80% up days. 2016 case, we have a 913, we have a Fed pivot and back to back to back 80% up days. 2020 case, we have a 913, a major Fed pivot, and right after the low, back to back to back 80% up days. So you can make an argument in the present day, we have a 913, we have some form of a Fed pivot, and we have back to back to back 80% up days. Thus, it's logical to ask an answer. In these three previous instances, what happened next in the stock market? Well, from a risk perspective, in the S&P 500 index, the drawdowns for the most part were muted. In one case, this is pretty painful, a 6% give back in six calendar days. The average drawdown in three cases, 2.18%, the median drawdown about a half a percent, and you can see they happen very, very quickly. How about the drawdowns of the NASDAQ 100 based on the same signal dates? A little bit larger, roughly 3%, with the largest one being a fairly significant drop of 5.2% in six calendar days. Thus, even if the present day turns out to be similar to the 2020 case, the 2016 case, and or the 2011 case, it doesn't necessarily mean we would go straight up from here, and there still could be some pain involved. How about the potential upside relative to these historical cases? Outstanding. In the S&P 500 index, the average gain one year later was 33%, two years later 53%, in the NASDAQ one year later 39.41%, two years later 65%. We often say in these videos, in the stock market, nothing is binary. You have the 9 and the 13. Shouldn't we just take all of our chips and push them to the center of the table? It's never that easy. Straight from the horse's mouth. If you saw this article here, Market Watch article dated May 20th, DeMarc said we needed one more sell-off in the S&P 500 with a close below 38.63. Well, that hasn't happened yet. So based on those comments from DeMarc published on May 20th, even DeMarc wouldn't have thrown all caution to the wind heading into this week. And hypothetically, if we did get one more sell-off in the S&P 500 with a close below 38.63, that's a drop of 7.1% from Friday's close on May 27th. Now these drawdowns here and these drawdowns here for the S&P 500 and these very, very, very attractive longer-term historical returns are based on the last three instances where we saw back to back to back 80% up days. So that would be this case in 2020, this case in 2016, and this case in 2011. We also have a couple of instances near the low in 2010, so those cases worked out extremely well. But unfortunately, there's a case here, back to back to back 80% up days, where really, really bad things happened in the S&P 500 before good things happened. From this point here, the approximate drawdown in the S&P 500 before this low was hit, close to close, was about 27.4%. From this close to the intraday low here in March of 2009, it was a staggering 28.44%. So while we have a 913, we have some form of a Fed pivot, and we have back-to-back-to-back 80% up days, we have to keep in mind those are setups. Just as we had a setup here before approximately a 28% drop in the S&P 500, we still need price, momentum, and trends to confirm the setup. That occurred in this case, it occurred in this case, it occurred in this case, it occurred in this case. It did not occur in this case here. Now, in the present day, how is it possible that we could make a bottom? And how is it possible that we could see a significant additional drawdown? We've covered this chart before. This is the S&P 500, stocks greater than their 200-day moving average, the percent. You can see here, 
relative to these historical cases, so here's the COVID low, we're really not in the same oversold region telling us relative to these cases, it is possible the market needs to drop further to get down to these levels here where major lows occurred in the past. And another way, hypothetically, that a drawdown like this could be possible, we didn't get the Fed pivot or the potential or possible Fed pivot from Chairman Powell. And these articles here, and taking the minutes from the meeting that are a few weeks old now and assuming it means the Fed is shifting policy or pivoting, that remains to be seen. Remember, the minutes were from the May 4th meeting. Powell spoke on May 17th. He really doesn't sound like a chairman that's pivoting. In fact, this is what Powell said on May 17th. Restoring price stability is an unconditional need. It is something we have to do. There could be some pain involved. And he said it might lead to the unemployment rate rising slightly. We don't have that yet. And that tells you Powell may be prepared to tighten significantly before this is over. So one possible hypothetical scenario is that Powell comes out and says, the read is too dovish. We don't want the market to think we're soft on inflation. We need to come out and make some statements to kind of turn that narrative back around. That's one possibility. So if the S&P came down to these levels here and we saw something similar relative to this case here on the back to back to back 80% up days, things still could be ugly. Odds have improved. It's a lot different from saying a bottom is in. This is a chart that we showed last week. The NASDAQ is trying to make a stand here at a relevant level, this gap. So the NASDAQ has gone all the way back to this gap from November of 2020. And it did have a strong push here, but it really hasn't broken out of this wedge formation yet. And relative to this case and these type of drawdowns, we still have a situation where many markets have an air pocket type look. We covered this chart last week and Bitcoin to the US dollar actually dropped this week. This is still a dicey looking chart. A similar situation here. We covered this chart last week with this line here and this line here. We did rally back above this line, but we still have potential resistance from this area up here. So let's say hypothetically the market rallies into this area here, the Dow Jones composite, and then drops down to the level where the NASDAQ has already dropped. That's a lot of risk. That's a drop of 18.39% from this point here to this point here, hypothetically. You can clearly see here the trends right now are still down. And this chart has improved. It did take out this level, this level, and this level, but that's tier one. There's a whole nother area of tier two potential support up here in the vicinity of these moving averages that it has not dealt with yet. So this chart shows us the need for balance. This is a weekly DeMarc chart as of the close on the 27th. The hypothetical upside target from Friday's close is 23.22%. The hypothetical downside target, 12.12%. This is a TDST level, a weekly bull bear demarcation line here. We still closed below it. So this number here is telling us if the low is in, haven't necessarily missed anything. There's a lot of potential upside. This is telling us that we can't forget that we're still dealing with the downtrend and we have several areas of potential resistance above. And if we're rejected in this area here, we could still have an air pocket decline that aligns with that 2008 like case. And if we add volume by price on this chart, you can see the white space that we filled here. This tends to be easier white space. When we get up into here, a lot more difficult in here. And here's the weekly chart as of May 27th. Really all we've done is rally back 
to the weekly closing low here in the Dow Composite from March. So you can make an argument that this is a bearish breakdown and this is a retest here of this breakdown. Bullish odds obviously improve if you can get out here. The longer you stay there, the more meaningful it becomes. And when we look at these charts, we're really not seeing anything here that we didn't try to psychologically prepare ourselves for. We covered this chart on May 13th and said, we've fallen a long, long way. Even if, hypothetically, bad things are going to happen, it wouldn't be shocking if the market rallied back strongly into these areas here. And as we walk through these charts, so far that's really what we have. Something that we talked about on May 13th. Here's a look at the Dow last week. You can see the breakdown. How much improvement this week? Did we clear this level and this level? Are we out here? The answer to those questions are all no, no, and no. We've basically rallied back in the easy white space. This was pretty easy to fill. It's gonna get a lot more difficult to fill in here. And from a risk reward perspective, we have a lot of potential resistance very, very close by on this chart. And if this retest fails, our potential downside, if we go back to where the NASDAQ has already dropped back to, that hypothetically from Friday's close will be a drop of 15.69%. So the charts aren't saying throw all caution to the wind at this point. The probabilities will improve tremendously if we can clear some of these levels here. If we can get out here and stay here, then the risk reward ratio starts to improve immensely. Right now it's improved a little bit. Hence our exposure to risk was ratcheted up a little bit. Similar situation here, NYSE composite last week. These were the lines in the sand. We've really just rallied back into tier two. And we've got the moving averages, the 50 day right above us. If we were to drop back to this level here, hypothetically, that's a drop of 16.88%. And you can see here, volume by price, same thing. Right here, we cleared the easy white space this week. Gets a lot harder to clear the white space up here from a potential resistance perspective. You can see it here on this chart too. This is your real heavy resistance in here. This is much lighter resistance here and here. So once again, we cleared and filled the easy white space. Now it gets harder. Doesn't mean we're gonna get rejected. It's just going to be harder. S&P 100 last week, the same concepts here. Not a lot of improvement really. The drop to this level here from Friday's close would be over 16% hypothetically. S&P 1500, you've got this tight cluster of moving averages. This is last week. This week, like many of the charts, we basically filled the easy white space again. S&P 500 a week ago. Very, very similar concepts. Not really changing any of these charts. We drew this line and showed it last week. This line was here last week. If we fast forward to this week, we really haven't done anything particularly difficult yet. And if we rally back to 4,300, you still have to contend with a lot of resistance in there. The drop from this level here down to where the NASDAQ is today is about 20%, 21%. And the drop from where we are now, hypothetically, is 18.23%. So you have to look at our risk reward now, it would change significantly again if price were here. It's not there yet. Last week, value line arithmetic index, exact same concepts. How much improvement this week? Once again, we filled the easy white space. This is the chart of Apple that we showed last week. Here's the breakdown. We didn't recapture this line this week. That may happen, hasn't happened yet have seen some improvement in the credit markets, but still you're getting back into this area here where resistance is gonna get a little tougher. If you were to look at this chart here closely, AGG IEF, it lost this breakout from this level, this level, this level, and this level, and it hasn't recaptured it yet. If you're a stock market bull, you'd prefer to see, this is the bullish look here from the COVID low. I still have a tepid look over here on this chart. 
unquestionably some nice moves in the credit markets telling us to keep an open mind about the bottom being in place. Still has some work to do. Same concepts. Here's Microsoft last week. All we did this week so far was fill very, very easy low resistance white space. Momentum factor ETF, a nice push back, but still has hurdles above. Here's that two-tiered look that we talked about. This is the NASDAQ 100 on May 20th, a week ago. We still could get an easy push into this area here, and really even all the way into this area up here would be relatively easy, and then it gets a lot harder. Similar concepts, now we're looking at the triple Qs, really just filling for the most part easy white space. This is an impressive chart. If you look at this trend line here that was broken, value recaptured it and value closed above all of the moving averages. So one hypothesis is that the market really is that COVID, the lockdowns, the stay at home trade caused tech and growth stocks to get to stretched or extreme valuations, call it a bubble if you like. And we really just needed to take back some of that excess. And it was really tech and growth that really needed to get whacked. And if that's the case, and the NASDAQ's bottoming here, which is quite possible, it's definitely trying to make a stand at a logical level. Now it's also possible that things like energy and value and dividend payers don't need to get whacked to the same extent, and they just needed to have a correction. So we'll learn something based on how leaders act. If you're a stock market bull, you would really like to see VTV go up here and make a new all-time high and see these moving averages turn up. If you're a stock market bear, you want just the opposite. You want to get rejected up in this area here and see price down here fairly quickly. Here's XLK. It got through tier one, the easy tier. Now it's headed to tier two. Similar situation here. If it can clear the moving averages and hold, similar to what we just talked about with VTV, that would be a very, very constructive sign. This tends to lean bullish for stocks. This is XLP divided by SPY up here. This is weekly. You can see when the ratio dropped below the 200 week here, good things happened in the stock market. This is Q4 of 2016. Similar situation here. When we got a weekly close below the 200 week, it was after the COVID low. We did get a weekly close this week below. The longer we stay below, the more meaningful it becomes. Can also make an argument down here that this is your left shoulder, this is your head, and this is your right shoulder. But right now, the breakout is still holding. This almost looks like a mini version of this over here. Same concepts here. You can see SPY challenging these areas here as of Friday's close really hasn't done a whole lot yet. If we look at the S&P 500, a downward sloping trend line comes in somewhere in the neighborhood of 4150 to 4175 ish. We also have levels here, here, and here. So we'll learn something here. This is that patience factor. The odds start to improve if you can get out here. We're not there yet. Very, very similar concepts here with VU. This is potential resistance in here. This is a constructive look in here, but we don't have a moving average crossover like we had right here. We may get it very, very soon. We also don't have a breakdown yet in the VIX. Overall, the VIX probably leans bullish at this point. It would lean even more bullish if we can get a close down in this area here. Similar concepts with the moving averages. See here when we started to rally, how blue the fastest moving average slices through. And here when we had somewhat of a failed attempt, it looks feeble. We look pretty feeble down here. The S&P was up 100 points and we still haven't gotten the eight day moving average to cross the 15, the 18 or the 21. That's not saying it's not going to happen. It just doesn't look that great down here yet. Here's the whole concept here, volume by price. In here, this will be easier white space to fill still all the way up to roughly the 50-day moving average and the 75-day moving average for SPY. 
When you get up here, it's going to get a lot harder to clear these levels. So it will be even more impressive if we can get out here like VTV has already done and if we can stay there. This is just showing where we went down last week to the dotted line and held that was your bear market level. History tells us if we can hold above that level, typically good things can happen and so far we held. This is a week ago down here. We dropped below it intraday last Friday and we've rallied since. Remember we said the S&P 500 really didn't look that oversold? You can see the NASDAQ does. It's down in these areas where lows have happened in the past. Is it possible that it would fall further? Absolutely, positively, yes, it's possible. But still, you're in an area now where you have to be open to a low in the NASDAQ. Similar situation here. You're down low enough on this reading to be open, but you can also see we're here when we were here, we still had a long way to fall in this one case. Global XUSA monthly, we weren't able to get back above this level at week's end. Bullish odds would improve if you can get over here and maybe more importantly above this level here. Still have a momentum problem on these charts. A week ago today, you could ask, why are we not in 100% cash? Well, this is one of the reasons here. Credit markets were starting to show a little bit of life. They did so again this week. Corporate bond index was up. Problem here is when you look back here all the way to 1997, there's only one other time where this index dropped below the 200 week moving average. And that was Q4 of 08. You can see for the COVID low, we held this level here. So while this was constructive here, this is still that case where the S&P had quite a bit further to fall in Q4 of 08, even when the credit market started to rally. So it's somewhat of a mixed bag. This is a positive development, but it doesn't take the Q4 into Q1 decline in the S&P 500 off the table. Similar situation here. We don't have a breakdown in TLT SPY. Bullish odds would increase if this ratio can get down here. It may do it, it just hasn't done it yet. MISC advanced decline line. This is based on issues. Not really that impressive yet. And we did get a nice pop here in the high yield market, but you can see as of Friday's close, we haven't broken this downward sloping trend line. Not gonna kill us to see if we can get to this side. You can pause your video player here. This is the McClellan Oscillator. This is a positive development here. This is the close on Friday, May 27th. It's rare, similar to the COVID low, similar to the 2018, early 2019 low, similar to the 2016 low. That's all great news. Unfortunately, it's also similar to the Q4 2008 situation. This point right here, right here see where we are here that's basically identical to this oops point right here where the s p 500 dropped almost 30 percent after a similar reading so question do the back to back to back 80 percent up days improve the odds that a low is in place absolutely positively yes improve the odds it's not a certainty we can ask and answer the same questions here the odds have improved it doesn't necessarily mean we're out of the woods yet. So when we take a look at this here in 08, 09, we take a look at this here, 08, 09, and we take a look at all of the overhead resistance that we still have to deal with and all of these air pocket looks that we still have, it is prudent to be taking a measured approach, which is exactly what we're doing. If you're a client, Measured in here, you become a lot less measured the more boxes you can check off. And keep in mind, when we cover charts of the Dow Jones Composite Average, this is not the Dow Jones Industrial. This is a multi-sector average, very, very similar to the S&P 500. One of the big differences is it's not nearly as skewed by tech as the S&P 500 is, and thus, it may be more representative of the market as a whole relative to all of these sectors up here. Easy white space, 
a lot harder white space above in here. And relative to this up here, this is almost air pocket central down here. A little bit of support in here and then another air pocket down to where the NASDAQ is trading today. This says don't forget the 2008-2009 case. This says don't forget the 2008-2009 case where we rally strongly here into approximately January 2nd of 2009 and then we don't have the final low here in the S&P 500 until March 9th of 2009. The intraday low is made, I believe, on Friday, March 6th. So those are two things that say don't forget this period. You make an argument here, here's a third. See this up here, this is the 10 year yield divided by the S&P 500. You can make an argument here that the market starts to get really, really scared about economic growth and takes a whole nother leg down. You make the same argument here. In this case, in 2018, it's probably more that the market's concerned with the Fed raising rates too fast in here, and then they get concerned about growth. You can see we bounce off the trend line, but the S&P 500 falls a long way. So from here, the first time you fall from this trend line, the stock market has not bottomed. When you fall from the trend line here, the stock market has not bottomed. It's still got another leg down. You can make an argument. This is a similar situation here. And you can make an argument that this shift is market participants are starting to buy bonds now because they're getting nervous about the hit to growth in subsequent quarters. I have to reiterate as well, how could we take a whole nother leg down like this or like this into the Christmas Eve low here? It's very, very possible that the Fed chairman doesn't really like the read from the market and he may feel that he needs to come out or somebody needs to come out and say something about we haven't committed to any type of pause just yet. All hypothetical, but you can read these quotes from the Fed chairman on May 17th. This is well after the Fed minutes and well after the last Fed meeting. If you hear the word pause or potential pause or evaluate from Powell himself, that's a different story than hearing it from Raphael Bostic from Atlanta. To summarize, we do have evidence in hand historically that supports the possibility of a final low being in place. We also have evidence in hand that leaves the door open to the 2008 type much lower low case. That's just a fact. This is a fact and this is a fact. DeMarc counts back to back to back 80% up days. Those are setups. We still need price trends and momentum to confirm. We have some of that, some very little baby steps. Need to see more. We may get it, we may not get it. In terms of this bullet point here, let's cover one anecdotal example. You can find this tweet here in our Twitter feed. This chart's dated May 26th. You can see we're not really getting much of a thrust-like look here. After three back-to-back-to-back 80% up days, do we have something like this over here? 2016 low, do we have something like this straight up from the October 2011 low? Do we have a V look similar to the COVID low? The answer is not yet. You can barely tell the difference between the chart on May 27th down here and May 26th down here. This is the 26th some improvement on the 27th. So this is one example of the type of thing that we would look for going forward to allocate capital in a more aggressive manner. Not making any assumptions about what any of this is going to look like. This is what it looks like today. Still fairly tepid at this point. We've shown numerous charts with the easy white space relative to the harder white space. Continue with that measured pace until observable improvement, additional observable improvement. And right now, the trends unequivocally remain down. The S&P 500 has made one higher high, and it's not even a significant higher high. Remember, we said last week, don't assume when you have weak trends, you're dead in the water. Last week, we said, go look at 2016. The trends look terrible. 
In fact, we ran trend strength scores for 2016 during the day today, and we didn't even know that the three 80% up days was gonna tie that period to the present day. Trend scores are terrible today. They were terrible in February of 2016. That is not a showstopper, but it is part of the weight of the evidence. Breath data is mixed. S&P 500 could fall a lot further. NASDAQ is at a point where you can say, looks pretty oversold relative to historical standards. Even sentiment can't rule out the worst case scenarios. You have bear sentiment in 2008 and bad things still happen. Huge wild cards here, bullish and bearish, especially if the Fed comes back and tries to downplay the thought of a pause in the next few weeks. Nothing's really changed on these fronts here. If a low is in place, it always feels like we're missing out. History says that's not the case. And history also says that jumping the gun, meaning ignoring the charts and just guessing, can be very costly. One example here, that the upside from Friday's close could still be significant. No need to panic yet. This also says the downside could be significant. And if you look at a weekly DeMarc chart, you have active 913 sell signals up here. What do you have down here? Nothing. You don't even have an active nine buy setup down here yet. It's something that just happened. If the present day is like the COVID low, the 2016 low and the 2011 low, the S&P 500 could gain 50% in the next two years. The NASDAQ could gain something on the order of 65%, the NASDAQ 100. Thus, if a low is in place, it doesn't mean we've missed the opportunity. You'll notice we're covering the same charts this week that we covered last week and the week before. Why is that? Because they're relevant and helpful from a bullish and bearish perspective. We don't have to come up with whole new methods from week to week. We all know the only way that any of this works and the only way that we can interpret all of this properly is if we head into next week and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates, or clients, may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.